So again, and I, and I've spoken on this about about this on on other episodes of the podcast, but to then purely think of Adam as he must be a physical person and that there and that at the very least there's nothing else going on here, citizen, move along. These aren't the droids you're looking for. It's foolish. I think it's very foolish because again, it I say this all the time. Why if God is really trying to communicate with us, if he's using the form of literature of story of of storytelling and these again, these motifs, these things of storytelling show up all the time, why would we expect it to be any other way? The cognitive dissonance that happens here is, is astounding to me at times. And so when Mackie said that, I didn't know what to say. Hello, and welcome to the Belfast Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Byler. And we are doing the second episode, uh, responding to the Q&A that Tim Mackey had at Hope Church, following his sermon called Beginning the Right Story on Genesis, on Creation. And I made one last night. I'm recording the second portion the more the day after. I happen to have two days off in a row, so here we are. Um, I want to draw our attention back to the main thrust of what attracted me to this talk in the first place, what it sparked in me, and how I was trying to also talk about it last time, which was Tim is doing this thing of taking our view of Genesis and stories in the first three chapters at the very least, if not the first 11, and trying to turn our attention to the time. The beginning is the time to make sure that the balances are correct to the time, the ancient Israelites, the audience, those people, and the place, right? The question he posed and the analogy he used earlier in this talk was, if Moses went to a bar with a Canaanite, an Egyptian, and they were to sit down and talk about what it means to be human, what it means to be in the world, how did we get here? Moses probably wouldn't start talking about the 24-hour cycle of days and the sprouting of vegetation on the earth and photosynthesis and any of that. He would be talking about Yahweh as creator, the way in which he makes the world with his words, the way in which humanity is specially made in his image, how he breathes life into them, how male and female come from him, how they are joined together and given the command to be fruitful and to multiply. That would be the major emphases of his story. And Tim has continued to use this language of narrative, of story. And, as I said at the end of the last video, we're about to have a discussion about Adam and Eve. So I've skipped ahead a little bit in this from where we left off, but that's what I mainly wanted to start discussing here, so that's where I figured we would start. And as a prelude to that, um, I want to read something from uh, the Space Trilogy or the Ransom Trilogy, um, or the Cosmic Trilogy, as many people would like to call it, because, well, as I might actually read later, Lewis does not like the term space. He thinks that the idea, he talks about it at the end of this book, the Out of the Silent Planet, the first book in the trilogy, he talks about it as if, you know, he can even get people to move from the idea of space to the idea of the heavens. He has done, he has accomplished his goal. But... What I'm going to read here is from the end of the first book. I, th I believe, let me look here. I believe it is from the last chapter. Uh, yeah, the last true chapter of narrative, the next chapter in this postscript. Um, kind of insert Lewis as a character, as someone who has been corresponding with Ransom. But this is Ransom when he's about to leave 
when he's about to leave Mars and how he feels about that. He concluded it was the forest lowland of the Fiffletrigi, or rather, one of their forest lowlands. For now, similar patches were appearing in all directions, some of them mere blobs at the intersection of ha Andromedus, some of vast extent. He became vividly conscious that his knowledge of Malkandra was minute, local, parochial. It was as if a Sorn had journeyed 40 million miles to Earth and spent his stay there between Washington and Brighton, or between Worthing and Brighton. See, I'm so American, I even read American names into um, British, British places. He reflected that he would have very little to show for his amazing voyage if he survived it. A smattering of the language, a few landscapes, some half-understood physics. But there were the statistics, the history, the broad survey of extraterrestrial conditions, which such a traveler ought to bring back. Those Hondromedus, for example, seen from their height, which the spaceship had now attained, and all their unmistakable geometry, they put to shame his original impression that there were they were natural valleys. They were gigantic feats of engineering about which he had learned nothing. Feats accomplished, if all were true, before human history began, before animal history began. Or was that only mythology? He knew it would seem like mythology when he got back to Earth, if he got back. But the presence of Oyarso was still too fresh a memory to allow him any real doubts. It even occurred to him that the distinction between history and mythology might be itself meaningless outside the Earth. Like, think of where the understanding of the physical universe will be then. And the way they'll look back on us playing with four dimensions with a little helmet, you know. And they'll look at us and say, oh, how primitive. Right? But, but think about it. So here's what I hope they wouldn't do, is I hope they wouldn't say, you know, um, you know, they used to think the world was only three dimensions. So He's using this example of how... This is something that Walton talks about, how when cosmic geography or when science changes and develops, when we learn more about the properties of the physical world, we learn how to manipulate it in different ways. And so Mackey's used an example of, you know, if technology gets this good, if our perceptions of how the physical world operates get good enough to even understand more dimensions than three, how are we going to look at, or how are those people in the future going to look at us now when we want to, and this is something he brought up before, want to look at those in the past as so primitive, as people who don't understand, as people who are out of touch, as people who are thinking wrongly about the world. Silly how they were, and then try and take their conception of whatever, of the universe then, and try and marry it with ours. It's just like, no, here we are. This is our conception of the universe. We talk about it. We still use language like the sun rises, even though it, we know it doesn't. We're the ones who are right, moving around. And so it's just different. And so in the same way, I want to respect the way we see the universe now, based on rocks and test tubes, has its own integrity, and you can sit alongside there. And so there I just think, I don't think the chronology of the biblical authors, I don't think we're supposed to try and map it on to ours. I know people disagree with me on that, and I'm okay with that. But for me, I don't know any other way to make it consistent and coherent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a guy playing with the four-dimensional toy thing. There's another video oh, oh, um, uh, of it. Okay. But yeah, he's, pl he's, he's, pl he's in the virtual environment. Okay. Um, so I think where it lands me, I'm sorry. I have a hard time being concise on these matters. I think where it lands me is, I think I'm pressing Genesis 1 through 11 to tell me things it's not designed to tell me when I'm trying to reconstruct a history of the universe by the chronology in Genesis 1 through 11. But and you do believe... Again, this is back to... Tim is doing a very great job of of explaining the thing, and this is what he does, that he that he is... that has, you know, given him the fame that he has, the given him the platform as much as I kind of hate that word now, that he has, as much as it's given him the reach that he has, let's say, that's maybe a better word, is that he, as he's done earlier in this talk, he will investigate and he can expose the 
layers that are underneath the questions that people are asking. He gets to, let's say, the heart of the matter. And so this comes in the beginning when he said, you know, that question has maybe three questions behind it because it presumes certain things about the about the about the world or about the text right and this isn't i don't think he's playing a post to just make this a side comment for a second i don't think he's playing a postmodern game of like of infinite speculation or infinite relativity in the sense of like mm, i see what you're doing there i think what he's really doing is he's doing a true he's truly trying to investigate and say when you ask me that, are, do you mean this thing or do you mean this thing? Are you is is this kind of thinking underlying what you're what you're asking here? Because if I can get that right, if we can understand that thing together, then we can dissect this and truly understand what we're talking about. So it's not deconstruction or dissection for the sake of that thing, but it's uh, you could think of it as excavation. Maybe that's a better word to use. So, I'm um, trying to give these images. Um, I think that's kind of what he's getting after here. Um, but the the point that's being made about the timeline, the chronology, is what showed up in the questions about dinosaurs and showed up, as I spent some time talking about last uh, video, on the, uh, well, who, whoever wrote the first 11 chapters of the first couple chapters of Genesis had to have been divinely inspired because they were writing about things before there were any humans. And, and Tim Mackey makes the analogy. Like, it's difficult to think about that. It's like um, video footage download of the beginning of the world. Like, that's just not the genre it's playing in. And so let's, let's go forward. They're about to ask him about Adam and Eve specifically. Even a literal Adam and Eve. Um, Depends on what you mean by literal. Well, I believe that humans came from somewhere. Okay. <laughs> but even Jesus referred to Adam, so Paul referred yeah, to Adam. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, but there we have to ask, what are they referring to? They're referring to a narrative figure in, right, on pages one and two of the Bible. Sure. Um, so let's go back to pages one and two of the Bible. What do they tell us? They tell us about, I mean, Adam's name means human. Right. <laughs> it means humanity. Uh, and uh, Eve's name means life. So you have humanity and life. And Okay, I'm going to rewind that because I think when I heard this the first time, I had to pause it and I sat there with my head on my desk not knowing what to do. It's before I taken any Hebrew, obviously. This was, again, in my journey of trying to figure out what this means. How do I take this story, this book? And what is going on here? And so even him pointing out, look, man, human, Adam, Adama, human, life, ground, earth, like the extensions of Adam in Hebrew have have all of this, you know, webbing complexity in the way that the word can get transformed and used. And so it's describing things with things that, you know, he makes Adam from the Adama, like he makes the human from the earth, from the dust. And even just that word play itself and Eve being life, that, that wordplay, right? I mean, okay, so I'm reading the Ransom trilogy, but I can't help but think about Ransom as the character in Knives Out, who, I mean, as much as I could dog on Ryan Johnson's handling of Star Wars or of his second Knives Out film, which I think very much is, is very much a... Um, uh, a lesser sequel. The character's name is Ransom. Like even in the even in the space trilogy, even in Out of the Silent Planet, Ransom is used as 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 the bargaining chip um, 
to Oyarsa, to to the Eldil in in Malacandra. He he is um he is the ca- the captured one who is used to bargain with who the other humans think of as the like bloodthirsty gods. And so then the the ransom character spoilers for I guess for the ransom trilogy and for um, uh, knives out ransom is is Chris Evans character is the bad brother who holds who demands the ransom from Ana de Armas's character from the good nurse. So it's like even on a name level, my I had my good friend here. He we were talking about the movie, and he goes, "Dude, once I heard Ransom Ransom's name, I was like, if he's not the bad guy, Johnson's doing something wrong." And there he goes, he's the bad guy. Same thing in in Lewis's naming of of um of Ransom in in the space in the in the space trilogy, in the cosmic trilogy. So again, and I, and I've spoken on this about about this on on other episodes of the podcast but to then purely think of adam as he must be a physical person and that there and that at the very least there's nothing else going on here citizen move along these aren't the droids you're looking for is foolish i think it's very foolish because again it i say this all the time why if God is really trying to communicate with us, if he's using the form of literature, of story, of, of storytelling, and these, again, these motifs, these things of storytelling show up all the time, why would we expect it to be any other way? The cognitive dissonance that happens here is, is astounding to me at times. And so when Mackie said that I didn't know what to say because I thought, duh, that's how it goes in every story and every good story. Good authors know how to name all their characters to allude to something. Um, I'm going to have to get another book. Okay. Stephen King on writing. I'll make myself a little smaller so you can read it all. On the craft of writing, on storytelling, on the fact that this is how it happens in all other aspects. Why would we expect it to be any different? But wait, symbolism doesn't have to be difficult and relentlessly brain brainy. Nor does it have to be consciously crafted as a kind of ornamental Turkish rug upon which the furniture of the story stands. If you go along with the concept of the story as a pre-existing thing, a fossil in the ground, then symbolism must also be pre-existing, right? just another bone or set of them, and your new discovery. That's if it's there. If it isn't, so what? You've still got the story itself, don't you? If it is there, if you notice it, if you think you should bring it out as well as you can, polishing it until it shines, then cutting it away, cutting it the way a jeweler would cut a precious or semi-precious stone. Carrie, as I've already noted, is a short novel about a picked on girl who discovers tel- her telekinetic ability within herself she can move objects by thinking about them to atone for a vicious shower room prank in which she has participated carrie's classmate susan snell persuades her boyfriend to invite carrie to the senior prom they are elect a king and queen during the celebration another of carrie's classmates the unpleasant christine Hargen- hargenson pulls a second prank on carrie this one deadly Carrie takes her revenge by using her telekinetic power to kill most of her classmates and her atrocious mother before dying herself. That's the whole deal, really. It's a simple, it's as simple as a fairy tale. There was no need to mess it up with bells and whistles, although I did add a number of epistolary interludes, passage from fictional books, a diary entry, letters, telesco- tel- teletype bulletins. Between narrative segments, this was part of, partially to inject a greater sense of realism, I was thinking of Orin, Orson Welles' radio adaptation of War of the Worlds, but mostly because the first draft of the novel was so damn short, it barely seemed like a novel. When I read Carrie over a period to start the second draft, I noticed there was blood, 
at all three crucial points of the story. Beginning, Carrie's paranormal ability is apparently brought on by her first menstrual period, Climax, the prank which sets Carrie off at the prom involves a bucket of pig's blood, pig's blood for a pig, Chris Harginson tells her boyfriend, and end, Susan Snell, the girl who tries to help Carrie, discovers she is not pregnant, as she has half hoped and half feared when she gets her own period. There's plenty of blood in most horror stories, of course. It is our stock and trade, you might say. Still, the blood in Carrie seems more than just splatter to me. It seems to mean something. That meaning wasn't consciously created, however. While writing Carrie, I never once stopped to think, ah, all this blood symbolism will win me brownie points with the critics. Boy, oh boy, this should certainly give me in, get me in a college bookstore or two. For one thing, a writer would have to be a lot crazier than I am to think of Carrie as anyone's intellectual treat. Intellectual treat or not, the significance of all the blood was hard to miss once I started reading over my bare and tea splattered first draft manuscripts. So I beer and tea splattered. Apologize. So I started to play with the idea, image, and emotional connections of blood, I trying to think of as many associations as I could. There were lots, most of them pretty heavy. Blood is strongly linked to the idea of sacrifice. For young women, it's associated with reaching physical maturity and the ability to bear children. And the Christian religion, plenty of others as well, it's symbolic of both sin and salvation. Finally, it's associated with a handing down of family traits and talents. We are said to look like this or behave like that because it's in our blood. We know this isn't very scientific, that those things are really in our genes and DNA patterns, but we use the one to summarize the others. Ah, so we speak symbolically. It is that ability to summarize and encapsulate that makes symbolism so interesting, useful, and when we, when used well, arresting. You could argue that it's really just another kind of figurative language. Depends on what you mean by figurative. Does that make it necessary to the success of your story or novel? Indeed not. And it can actually hurt, especially if you get carried away. Symbolism exists to adorn and enrich, not to create a sense of artificial profundity. None of the bells and whistles about the story are... None of the bells and whistles about are are about the story, all right? Only story is about story. Are you tired of hearing that yet? I hope, because I'm not even close to getting done saying it. Symbolism, and other adornments too, deserve a useful purpose. Though it's more than just chrome on the grill, it can serve as a focusing device for both you and your reader, hoping to create a more unified and pleasing work. I think that when you read your manuscript over, and when you talk it over, you'll see if symbolism or the potential for it exists. If it doesn't, leave well enough alone. If it does, however, if it's clearly a part of the fossil you're working to go underneath, or to you're working to unearth, go for it. Enhance it. You're a monkey if you don't. Ah, here's, here's another example. John Coffey, again, back to names and stories. I most often see chances to add the grace notes and ornamental touches after my basic storytelling job is done. Once in a while, it comes earlier. Not long after I began The Green Mile and realized my main character was an innocent man likely to be executed for the crime of another, I decided to give him the initials J.C., after the most famous innocent man of all time. I first saw this done in Light in August, still my favorite Faulkner novel, where the sacrificial lamb is named Joe Christmas, thus death row inmate John Bowes became John Coffee. I wasn't sure, right up to the end of the book, if my J.C. would live or die. I wanted him to live because I liked and pitied him, but I figured those initials couldn't hurt one way or the other. Mostly I, do, I don't see stuff like this until the story's done. Once it is, I'm able to kick back, read over, what I've written, and look for underlying patterns. Patterns. We'll come back to this quote from this book probably at some point soon. If I see some, and I almost always do, I can begin to at bringing them out in a second, more fully realized draft of the story. Two examples of the sort of, of 
work second drafts were made for oh, oh, sorry two examples of the sort of work second drafts were made for our symbolic and theme and then as i as we said about earlier we just read about carry and blood i want to give you one more example in a letter that tolkien wrote to i don't remember which who he wrote this letter to but i know this quote <clears throat> Again, just remember what we just read. Tolkien himself said, The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. That is why I have not put in or have cut out particularly all references to anything like religion, to cults or practices, in the imagery of the world. For the religious element is absorbed into the story and symbolism. What does it mean to tell history? What does it mean to write a story? What does it mean to have characters named Ransom? What does it mean to have blood as a uh, making its appearance in major focal points of your narrative? What does it mean to have a main character with the initials JC? What does it mean to have something unconsciously at first, but consciously in the second draft, be a very religious and Catholic work? Again, why would we expect it to be any other way? And if these stories in Genesis are telling us something about the world, are telling us something about humanity, are telling us something about our lives, why would the characters then not be named human life? There might be something going on here more than just a telling of the physical processes of the coming about of creation. At least that's what a good author would do. So maybe you just think the authors of the Bible aren't good at doing stories. Or maybe you do. What does that mean? And those narratives aren't only trying to tell us something that happened about the past. They're making a fundamental claim about the present, about mm -hmm. human nature. Like me and you and all of us, too. Um, so our, again, the question is, okay, did human beings come from somewhere? Yes. <laughs> so, did, so what was that process like? Is the biblical narrative trying to give us the kind of information that I wish I could get if I had a video camera or whatever, a time development motion? And I, uh, I just, I'm, I'm determined to not make the narrative say more than they say. Humans came from somewhere. And as far back as we can tell, our greatest parents have had the same moral compromise that we do. I think that's the claim of the narrative. Um, but how those two narrative figures correspond to early humanity that we could dig up or find evidence for in caves, I just, I have no idea. How can we know the answer to such a question? Um, that's, where I, that's where I'm at. Um, but for Jesus and Paul to make claims about Adam is to make a claim about humanity as rendered in the stories of, on pages one and two. Well, the entrance of sin and, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. okay, you're, yeah. messing, you're messing with this a little bit. Well, you're messing with my mind. Yeah, totally. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, half, I'm three quarters away where you are, but you're yeah. still messing with me. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, totally. I mean, I've, I've been disoriented since the day I became a Christian, right? well, okay. trying to make sense of the world. So we're all trying to make sense of the world in these texts. Um, yeah, but it's the same question, isn't it? It's on analogy. It's, I don't want Earth, I don't want to assume that Earth means globe the way I conceive of it. Mm. Sure. So what, does, what do humanity and life, those, right, those figures in the narrative, what do they refer to in actual history? That's the question we're asking. Because um, for me, it's very important 
that when I, especially once I get into like dateable Israelite history, that Abraham refers to a person that existed. Are you with me? Yeah. Um, Genesis 1 to 11 is, uh, breathes a different air precisely because those narratives are Israel, uh, Israelite authors in dialogue with their, inter- with their neighbors. So that's, um, a, that's an assumption right there. You're, you're making an mm, assumption. This uh, you're right. You're, I think you'd say this. It's an argument that I'm making. I think there's, ev- there's really good evidence for okay, it. Right. But, but you could question the evidence, and you could interpret that evidence a different way. And some people do. Yeah. Um, so, but even ah, so, there okay, actually okay, isn't hang on, a hang precise equivalent. Hang on. I'm gonna, we're gonna, it's just gonna be the callback that is just rings through this whole, this whole series. I'm, I'm sorry. I hope I don't annoy you. I just, I, there's some things I come back to like a broken record because I can't, I can't help it. I just, I want to, I just want this to be like the banging gong inside your head as you continue to think about these things. I think that fundamentalists and atheistic scientists have the same problem. The fundamentalists, so we could say the Christian fundamentalists in the US, make the proposition that biblical stories, we'll call them mythological stories, are literal representations of the truth. But, and that might be true depending on what you mean by literal. But what they mean by literal, or what they attempt to make literal mean, is that they're in the same category as scientific facts. Okay. Let's go back. Let's talk about this assumption that this guy brings up. That is, you're assuming. Um, That's an an assumption, right there. Those figures in the narrative, what do they refer to in actual history? That's the question we're asking. Um, Because for me, it's very important that when I, especially once I get into like dateable Israelite history, that Abraham refers to a person that existed. Are you with me? Yeah. Um, Genesis 1 to 11 is, uh, breathes a different air precisely because those narratives are Israel, uh, Israelite authors in dialogue with their, inter- with their neighbors. Um, so that's, a, that's an assumption. Right there. You're, you're making an mm. assumption. Ah, uh, you're right. You're, I think you'd say this. It's an argument that I'm making. I think there's, ev- there's really good evidence for okay. it. Right. But, but you could question the evidence, and you could interpret that evidence. Diff- okay. So, again, I, I don't mean to harp on this guy. I don't even know it's the same guy from earlier. Um, and this is, this is what I, again, like, and Tim Mackey's a little more gracious than I am. I guess at this point, um, he's saying there's strong evidence for these thinking that these things, these stories are in dialogue together. That they're that they're trying to talk about the world and about humanity in ways that aren't scientific. And this guy says, "Well, that's an assumption." I would have pointed out to him to say, also to say. Sure, you could say I'm assuming, but I have good evidence. But also, to assume that the that the by to to make the claim that the Bible is doing science or telling us about the time or the chronology of the bringing about of the earth is just as much an assumption. So that's that's all I have to say. Again, the scientific atheist and the Christian fundamentalist have the same problem. They're both looking at the same thing or wanting to look at the same set of criteria, let's say. What was Newbigin's phrase? Um, immutable facts about the physical world and say that they're, they're the same thing. There are that these theories that posit very different worldviews are speaking on the exact same thing. Different way. And some people do. Yeah. Um, so, but even so, there actually isn't a precise equivalent to the Adam and Eve figure in other literature. There's ancient kings, yeah. there's early gods, conceptions of gods battling and cutting each other up, and that's how the world comes into existence. But a- the Adam and Eve figures are unique. I think it's a uniquely biblical Israelite conception. But how those two figures 
co correlate to what we can, can reconstruct of the early history of humanity. I just, for me, I, um, if my conception of sin nature hangs on like DNA or genetics, I don't see that claim being made here. Um, what I see is a, a guy named Human <laughs> and his wife, and they constantly redefine good and evil to their own self-advantage. And then what I see from that moment is every other human in the story does that. And you're like, oh, what a perfect explanation of human history. <laughs> like, it makes sense. Uh, but the Bible doesn't, it doesn't seem to be being drawing an emphasis to this genetic conception for passing on sin. It's just ever since those humans did that, we all do it. Since. We've talked about this genetic conception of sin transmission in our video on original sin, which if I remember, I will try and link below. So if you haven't heard it, you can go listen to it. But there you go. That's a, that's, okay, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Related with that is that if we don't see it as a particular initial, original human and, and life mm -hmm. for people, then, and the, who sinned, who went against God. Yes, yeah. So, then we would be thinking that there may be other humans there. I mean, our mm. teachings yeah, seem to yeah, suggest yeah. there was one first Adam who that, failed. And that's a great point. Him. Actually, you know, yeah, the narrative is messing with us and so in Genesis because, of course, the classic thing of um, where did Cain's wife come from? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they had other children. It seemed... The, yeah. it no, seemed no, what I'm saying is Cain just, like, leaves yeah. after killing his brother and then he gets married. Yeah. Well, and he there's, built, there's, 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 there's <laughs> people who offered answers to that. Yeah. Th that's true. I mean, what I'm saying is the narrative, the narrative registers it right. as something that you have to find an answer to. Sure. Sure. Um, so there are different ways to answer that question. But it does... Um, so actually, there's a very ancient uh, Jewish and Christian <laughs> tradition that Adam and the Adam and Eve figures are priestly representatives among humans, and they're put into the divine temple to represent God on behalf of the rest of the humans, who then feature in the stories that come after them. Okay, again, I, I'm not trying to breeze over some stuff that's just become part of my thinking and talking about how these pieces of content changed my mind, but that, that is something I still wrestle with. I don't know, I don't know where I stand on that particular interpretation being, this is Joshua Somedas puts forth this idea. Um, uh, I know that John Walton's a big fan of this idea that Adam and Eve are the first, like, priest among humans. They're not necessarily the first human beings. But again, keep in mind, I'm sitting in my parents' bedroom, or sitting in my parents' bedroom. I'm sitting in my bedroom at my parents' house, head on my desk, hearing Tim Mackey say, well, Adam's name means human, and Eve's name means life. So these characters are human and life, like Ransom in the Cosmic Trilogy and, like, Ransom in the Knives Out movies or, like, the blood symbolism in Carrie or the John Coffey character in The Green Mile. So if this is what literary forums are doing in this storytelling, what does this mean for these characters as I've thought of them as, uh, like, some homo sapien that lived thousands of years ago uh, okay so it's if they weren't just literary figures maybe they were like maybe they were the human beings of or maybe they were the priests of many human beings what does that mean how to again like where does king get his wife and this is Maybe the chronology of the story, of the bringing about of the physical world, isn't the point of the story. Because you run into real, pro and they're all pushing back on Tim and his literary analysis here. The be well, there's 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 speculation for that. Yeah, speculation about like Adam and Eve having so many children that they can, you know, that there can then be. You know, someone for Cain to go marry by the time Cain and Abel are born. But as the narrative brings it to us, uh, it seems as though um, it seems as though Cain and Abel are the first children of Adam and Eve. They are explained to us as Peterson will call them the first true human beings. So they're kicked out of the garden. Adam tries to regain 
unity with his wife. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she bore a son. So he said, with the help of the Lord, I have born a son. And again, we aren't told explicitly, but it's kind of intimated in the text that these are the first children of Adam and Eve. They're the first true human beings that are out that are born outside the garden. And again, I guess you could interpret that and then say, well, maybe they're the first human beings born outside the garden, but there were many human beings to Adam and Eve that were born before they were kicked out of the garden. And also part of the curse is to uh, your pain be multiplied in childbearing. And in my younger years in high school, I can remember interpreting this as, ah, so maybe this means that Eve has already experienced childbearing, so then she knows what that looks like. Obviously, you could also say that she's seen animals bear children um, other than herself. And so uh, what exactly does that mean? These are possible explanations. Um, but again, I see them as like trying to like fulcrum in to the text this like scientific explanation of the propagation of other human beings that we aren't we just aren't given that maybe is again the wrong question to be asking about what's going on here. Mm-hmm.